Yeah. Good to go. Everyone hear me okay? It's always the same when you um, present somewhere. Uh, switching hands, Wi-Fi, nothing connects. It's always the same. <laughs> so, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Jamie. I'm a developer, and because I'm English, I'm a tea drinker. Um, <laughs> so, I'm from Newcastle. Uh, I have a, some people say I have a strong Geordie accent, so if you can't understand what I'm saying, um, good luck. This is Newcastle. Um, it's a small village. Uh, it's a, well, it's a city. Um, I, I'm from a small village. It's about 10 miles outside uh, of Newcastle. Um, that's a bit better. Um, I live pretty close to where Rowan Atkinson uh, and George Stevenson were born. Um, it's, very small, it's a very small town. It's uh, not too far, but you get Newcastle's got some great tech talent uh, and tech companies from there. And the company that I work for, Malton, we were founded there. Newcastle's famous for the Newcastle Brown Ale. Um, you may have seen or drank that before. Newcastle United Football Club. Um, you know, Newcastle's a very football heavy town as well. Um, so I'm a, I'm a supporter of those as well. Um, and Newcastle's also famous for the Angel of the North. I have no idea why they built this, but it's now an iconic English uh, statue that they built um, in the Northeast. So, and anyone pretty much flying or traveling into the Northeast will at some point see this. Um, so it's a pretty iconic piece. I wasn't sure what else to say. Um, if people weren't familiar where I was from. Um, and as I was researching this, I found out some facts myself. And actually, Newcastle, um, it was one of the um, mostly street in Newcastle. Um, it was the first street in the world to be lit by electricity. Um, and Newcastle itself was the first city to be powered, streetlights powered by electricity, which is, uh, I thought was pretty interesting. Um, I didn't know that. So, uh, I'm Jamie, I'm a developer at Molten, um, and Molten is a headless commerce API. Um, and I've spoke to a bunch of you before, before we start today, just to kind of get a sense of who, um, who's working with what kind of stack and who's familiar with JavaScript and the Jamstack. Um, but at Molten, we're a headless e-commerce API. I'm gonna talk all about, uh, about what that means and how that can help you, um, and how that relates to Jamstack itself and how commerce works there. Um, I work on things like documentation, SDKs, building examples, um, and really get the time and opportunity to play um, with new technologies and um, stacks like the Jamstack. Jamstack itself, uh, it can feel a bit scary, um, but one of my colleagues earlier on um, was kind of given a, a simple analogy, and the analogy um, was electric cars, electric vehicles have been around for a while. Um, it's nothing new. But Tesla, Tesla's like everybody loves Tesla. And Jamstack's like that part of the static site generators. And Gatsby and Hugo, as we heard, everyone's kind of trying and wants to use Gatsby because it's the hot new thing. And everyone's, everyone is looking to use Jamstack because it's the hot new thing. Um, but it's a, it's a really cool stack, and we're going to kind of dive into that um, a bit more. Um, the next slides, um, I was going to go into detail a little bit about um, what the, the Jamstack was and kind of covered that. But the JavaScript, that pretty much um, is the... Um, the code that runs on the client for the users. Uh, the API side of the, the Jamstack, the, the A, uh, that's the, the, um, the server-side code that can be accessed from the front end. So if you're building the front end website uh, with, with the static site generator, it's kind of, what, that's, it's all static. What can you do once the page is rendered? Um, interacting with APIs and doing some business logic, all of that kind of happen, has to happen at some point. Uh, and the way that we do that is by talking and connecting to an API. So that's uh, part of Jam. Markup is obviously the, the last page. And as we've seen uh, in that list.html, that's just HTML um, or text. And that can render to markup that can be presented to the user. Um, so that's pretty much the markup in the end of Jam. Um, and all of this is built at deployment. So all the code that you write and all, the, um, all of the logic that you write uh, when you're building your website, that's all just statically generated. And I'll go into some um, examples about what that what that looks like, um, specifically with commerce um, and how that works. So let's go on and dive in and talk about, um, talk about commerce. So who, who here um, has built or uh, used some sort of commerce platform or built a, an online store? Is there anyone here that's had the, the pleasure of doing that? Um, it's kind of painful, um, but when you do it right, it's kind of relieving as well because you can, you can design a commerce site uh, really well um, and you can use some t technologies and stacks that aren't as good and some are, and you just kind of get confused what I should do. And Jamstack came around and um, allowed us to do things a lot simpler and all of the build tools and um, 
technologies that we have today, um, as opposed to 15 years ago, um, makes that process a lot easier. So let's dive in and have a look at the process. Um, so you pick your platform. Uh, typically, you would pick your platform. So is it going to be Magento? Um, is it going to be something like WooCommerce, BigCommerce? All of those tools, you traditionally would pick one of those and you decide to go with it. You would then hand uh, some sort of specification off to a designer and the designer would go away and they would design uh, what your store is going to look like. Your nav's up here, your basket's here, the product page looks like this, uh, and this is how you add to the cart. And that's kind of handed off to the, the design team. And they're kind of, they're, they're restricted to the, the platform that you chose to use, that the designer has to implement the, some of the functionalities and they, might, they may invent some functionalities that just don't exist. Um, then that's where you would hand this over to the designer, uh, the, the developer. The design would be handed over to the developer who would then look to implement it. You would have to then build some kind of workaround because the designers, they've created some crazy concept uh, that just doesn't exist in the platform that you chose. Um, so you kind of have to build some work around to make that work. You have to kind of compromise and uh, agree on what can be done, what can't be done to get to market. Um, and then you typically launch the website into the, the, into the world. Um, and how you do that, how you deliver that, um, you, build, you build a site, you'd upload it to a server, and then you would render some dynamic HTML. And this is traditional. Uh, how you do this, th there could be other steps involved, but typically you would build the website, that upload part, Typically, back in the old day, you just FTP it. Now it's a bit easier with things like version control and continuous delivery. Uh, but then you would be uh, you you would end up with a result of some uh, web page that is uh, dynamically rendered, um, and we'll we'll talk about that as well. There are some restrictions to this, though. Uh, some restrictions is uh, platform lock-in or vendor lock-in because you chose those platforms uh, in in the original process kind of restricted to just doing what they do. Um, and you, you kind of get stuck into that very early on if you don't, if you don't plan out correctly. Um, and this is, you know, this is something we've done for years when building commerce sites. It's just, it, you know, it's part of the process. Often working with uh, some of the traditional platforms is it requires a round trip to the database to get product information. If I have a product website and, how often, and you want to render product information and product pages and prices and reviews, how often is that information updated really? How often do new photos arrive? Do I need to upload new photos daily? If not, um, then why can't it be static? Why, why, why isn't there a better way? Um, it's typically built on the LAMP stack, um, kind of. Um, there's a lot of solutions out there that use other things, um, and I'll talk about those as well, but typically people would use the, the LAMP stack, um, and that's another stack that uh, you can uh, go and look at if you're not familiar with, but we're only focused on Jamstack today. Um, and kind of supersede this a little bit. Uh, but traditionally, this is kind of the, the, uh, the stack that you would use and the restrictions that you, you're faced with. Um, and it's expensive. It's expensive when you have this um, platform that you've chose to then customize and build your own business logic around it to do things that your business and company needs. It's, uh, it's really difficult and it does become quite expensive to, to extend on. Uh, and it sometimes doesn't scale. If you've gotten... Uh, uh, you know, a vast rising amount of ST SKUs, the platform can um, sometimes slow down. Those round trips to the server can take longer as you begin to relate more data. It's having to fetch and do a lot of joins. That can be really painful when someone's trying to load a product page. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the static approach uh, has, a, has a great uh, advantage over this, and we'll dive into that. The developer exper experience of, of all of this um, I think it can't keep up with the rising dev trends, um, traditional, the traditional ways. That's why we see a lot of new tooling coming up every day. There's a new JavaScript po framework popped up in the last five minutes. Uh, that kind of stuff is, is, is joked about, but in reality, that experience is not good, um, especially if you're using um, some of the older stuff. Um, you can't kind of keep up with this, and you feel a bit that you're left out a little bit, um, and you're not using some of the new trends, and you're certainly not um, getting the advantage of using some of the newer technologies and stacks. So using some of the older traditional e-commerce platforms, you're kind of restricted to what you can learn um, and grow with. Sometimes, um, more often than not, there's no offline development environment. If you wanted to, um, back when I was creating e-commerce websites, you'd have to 
download the platform, run it on local host, and then you'd have some kind of dummy database. Um, and sometimes that would work, sometimes it wouldn't. You'd have to um, do, some, you know, there wasn't such things as migrations uh, sort of 10, 15 years ago um, that were easy to do. Uh, the, the environment, uh, the developer environment was, uh, was, was really poor, um, and that's significantly improved um, over the years. The deploy process, um, it's not as easy as hosting code on GitHub today and then clicking a button and it's deployed into production. Uh, the deploy process, as we mentioned earlier, as part of that delivery, uh, of the tr traditional delivery process, is you would have to manually upload it. Um, or you, there would be some kind of convoluted make file that is running some commands to, to send code around and then install dependencies. It's just unnecessarily um, complex. It, it's not needed in, in, in the way that we can build sites today. We can offload all of that complexity uh, to some of the frameworks that exist today. And quite often, uh, you're left with a bulky, slow admin panel to manage, manage your products. You log in, you're presented with something that looks really confusing. There's nav and drop downs everywhere. There's products and tabs, and it just feels overwhelming. You spend more time reading the help and the how to uh, guides on the website than actually implementing commerce and delivering uh, commerce to your um, customers and clients. Uh, flexibility is another one. You kind, of, you kind of lack a lot of the flexibility. You're, you're locked into the platform. You can do what they say. You can't really expand on that um, and all of that. Um, oh, yeah. And lastly, you've got that limited uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment process. That's kind of part of the, the deploy process there. You kind, of, you kind of lack that a little bit unless you've got those complex make files I mentioned. And all of this, I think, leads to a bad developer experience. That's not good. Developers, we, we like things that are simple, easy to use, um, well thought out, battle tested. Um, and some of that stuff, although battle tested, um, you end up having to repay at some point that tech debt adds up as you begin to try to expand it and add, add flexibility. We've, in, in my experience, and some of the sites I've created, we've paid agencies to build on these platforms to offer new functionality. And then only one person knows how to maintain that functionality, it just becomes really convoluted and, and outdated quickly um, and highly insecure. Bulky slow admin. I said, uh, that's often what you're faced with. This is Magento. I used this back way back in the day. Um, Magento is really cool, um, but back in the old day, you were faced with a lot of options and drop downs and far too much, uh, far too much choice to be able to um, deliver commerce in the way that you wanted. Um, but enough about that. But why do we do this? Why do we, why do we build? Um, why, do, why did we used to build like this? Um, and today, we, we're, we're maybe forced to build like that. Um, but, but why do we do it? Sometimes it's a tight budget. The team says, this is the budget. This is the platform. We have to use this. Um, or it's a legacy system, not all. Um, capable um, or have the luxury of, of delivering um, greenfield projects, we have to kind of work um, within our budget. It was sometimes easy. We know, we know how to use a certain platform. I'll just use that again. It doesn't necessarily mean it's right. It's just how you know how to build. Um, and it's easy. I'm guilty of that. I'll put my hand up. I've used something time and time again because it was just the easiest route. I was able to get a product to market quick because I'd use it time and time again. Um, but as I said, it's, the experience is not great. Uh, you often trade flexibility for a lot of things. You'll end up having to just work around things, build things on top and layer stuff um, because you're restricted to just working um, with that specific vendor. Sometimes it was a common language. So a lot of people um, 10, 15 years ago solely just built using PHP for e-commerce stuff. It was really heavily uh, battle tested um, and people were kind of familiar with it. And a lot of the uh, tools and uh, stacks were PHP based. Um, so my first commerce, not commerce experience, um, so like to share a few thoughts on that. Um, and this is kind of why I joined Molten. Um, and one of the first experiences I had building uh, commerce websites. So I joined a company um, many, many years ago and I used, on my first day I was reading through the handbook and it was telling me um, what I should do, what my daily routine kind of looked like. And one of the first, first things it said on there as a development team, it was 9 a.m., log into the not commerce admin, go to the card and orders screen um, and you then would, it would say clear out card details. And I was like, 
okay, it's just some security that, that you know, they've been overly cautious here. They're gonna get rid of all of the hashed cards and um, expiry dates and numbers. Uh, actually, uh, when I went in there, it was 9.01 the next day. I was in, you had to dial into the actual um, table. I was using PHP, my admin, um, and you had to remove the card details. And as I looked at the card details, it was the card details. It was 4242, blah, blah. I, this, this doesn't sound good. And you know, that, 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 wasn't, that was not a great experience. Um, and this was a long time ago. Thankfully, we've moved on and learned from our mistakes. We've seen companies do that, uh, store and plain text passwords, that kind of thing. It's just a no. Um, but this was typical back then. Um, thankfully, we don't have to do that kind of thing today. So pretty much looked at this every day um, until I try to fix that problem. Um, and that's when I began to look at some of the tools and uh, tech around Jamstack. So I knew there had to be a better way. This was around the time of uh, people moving from Backbone to jQuery and people using Ruby on Rails to deliver commerce and build websites. Um, and that's where we ended up. So all of what I've said kind of... Uh, leads to a, um, has led to a, 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 develop, a, a poor developer experience and something that was kind of difficult to maintain, keep secure uh, and build on and extend. Um, you know, we've all been there, those who uh, raised their hands and, and said that they've built a commerce store, they'll be at some point doing that in part of that process, you just not wished that you had to do or you've thought there's a better way. Um, actually, there is now. There's a time for jam commerce. So there's jam stack. And Jamstack with Jam Commerce. I'm trying to coin this term, so hashtag this. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> what, it, what, is, what is Jam Commerce? So, I break this down into to three things mainly um, flexibility, speed, and control. At Molten, that's the kind of thing we hear day in, day out that our developers building commerce sites want to use um, and what they, what they favor. They want something that is highly uh, flexible, uh, is great with speed, and they have uh, vast amounts of control. Flexibility, what, kind of th what does that mean? We've got more creativity. Um, we can work with the tools that we want. We can use Hugo, we can use Jekyll, we can use Gatsby. Um, we've got the, cre the creative freedom to do what we want, how we want, and deliver those fantastic designs that the designer's done. We can implement that however we want. We can actually do that now. And we're not restricted by a platform because that's all front end. And we get to use those APIs to make that possible. And lastly, lastly, we get to integrate with the, the tools that you already use, so the, the dev environment that you have, um, all, of the, all, of the, all of the tools that you use, you can, you can, you can pretty much continue to use. You don't have to install anything. Uh, then we get speed. Atomic deploys make it super easy for sharing new features with the team. You get a short immutable URL that can be passed around the team, passed to uh, marketing to approve. Uh, and that's just the URL that's completely immutable. And that if you're using a continuous deployment service like uh, Netlify, it'll give you your URL of the build and then you can share that with your team. Uh, and that, that's super fast to get stuff uh, into production. Uh, it's a faster build process. We see time and time again that a lot of people building on the Jamstack now are delivering uh, e-commerce experiences super fast. It's a matter of weeks. It's not taking months to build workarounds uh, and compromise. They're able to just deliver what they want, how they want, in super uh, quick time. Uh, and the dev experience is obviously uh, greatly improved as well when you're using some of the, the, the tech stack that we have today, especially on the front end. Um, this is all kind of focused around the front end. The front end on, in, uh, with, with commerce is, is, it's really good because you have the flexibility um, to, to do what you want, how you want. Uh, and as I said, got a faster time to market. You can pretty much get your store um, and all the changes that you need to make out there as quickly as possible. Control, so you can avoid complexity and bloat to your code. If you follow conventions like Hugo, I didn't need to install Go uh, in order to get a Go static site generator running. Uh, the binary there took care of all of that process for me. I didn't have to, uh, I didn't have to do any of that. Um, there's no bloat, there's no Go code in there um, that, that I'm able to do. Same with Gatsby, if I follow their conventions, I'm able to deliver super fast commerce in a super fast time without bloating my application or code base. Um, it, it, it's really powerful. You get to make all the decisions as well. Because it's the front end, you as a front end developer, you can integrate pretty much everything that the designer wants, uh, and then you can work with those APIs to, to make that actually possible. Um, so that the, you've got that freedom, the creative freedom, you get to make all the decisions um, and have total control 
uh, over the, the process. And it's pretty much easier to grow and expand that experience as well. You get to build those tools and, and do what you want uh, and expand your business as the, as the business needs to using Jamstack. So all of this, I think, leads to a greater developer experience, lower cost, and higher security. High security, I don't have to deploy servers or maintain servers and keep them patched and secured. Um, back when I was building uh, stuff on the LAMP stack, I was forever having to make sure that my PHP version was up to date, um, the database was uh, up to date, uh, and it was secure as well. That's kind of taken care, care, uh, care of today. Uh, things like Heroku, you can log in, you're able to uh, create a new site, upload a project, tell it to connect the database, it will go deploy your database, it will give you URL back, and you can connect to that within your application using an environment variable. And all of that technical part of what I've just said is all taken care of for me. I don't want to do that. That's, and you don't, you don't have to pay for a, a DevOps guy to handle that. Leave that to all the big companies and the big guys who specifically focus on that. Um, all of that, um, I think, leads to these three things here. So modern day commerce. So as I said, commerce today, it's not what it, it's not what it uh, was like 10 to 15 uh, years ago. Our shop today is, com uh, shop today is completely different. Uh, and if brands aren't delivering fast commerce experiences, ultimately, I'm potentially just going to lose money. And we're shopping in, in store now. We're paying for things with our card ever more. Um, I don't know, last time I carried cash and paid for something with cash, I'm using the card. Um, and if you use things like Square and you check out, if you've checked out with Square before, you'll walk out the store and you'll already have a receipt. Um, that is part of just daily life now. Um, that just wasn't possible back, back in the day um, without having all of that bloat and complexity. This stuff's just all taken care of. Traditionally, um, you, we got websites as well. So you would be able to buy and sell things online. Um, that kind of, it, it's kind of merging a little bit. So overall, the, the way in which commerce is delivered today is through an array of different solutions. We've got things like people just on their, on their PC, Mac, buying and uh, going through the website stuff. We've then got people on their phones, such as Instagram checkout or on a PWA checking out installing an application. They're able to pay for that and go. That's on a mobile. We've then got people on a TV who are paying for Netflix um, and doing all of that. That's commerce again uh, on a different application. We've then got people on their Apple Watch paying using Apple Pay. Uh, we've got traditional POS in there as well. Um, and then you're able to do other things uh, and like such as chat, um, be able to purchase and repeat orders inside of chat, the chat bot. And all of this has to happen somehow um, and kind of do that with APIs and uh, how, we how we decide to implement all of this can, can differ. We can use things like Swift to do the native apps. We can use Gatsby, Hugo to do all some of the, the mobile and the desktop stuff uh, and the POS stuff. We kind of just leave that to how it works or we can upgrade to use some of the newer all-in-one integrated um, POS solutions. Um, but there's a way to, to, um, to use all of this um, together, even if you can't and you don't have the opportunity to greenfield, you can use all of this stuff together um, using a variety of different services, and we at Molten make this super, super easy. Um, so we'll talk about what that kind of looks like um, in a couple of slides time. So modern day architecture, um, actually it's a slide here, uh, there we go. Um, so this is one of, our, uh, one of our customers last year. They came to, this, came to us with this great idea. Um, they had this POS system already. Uh, they were using KWI to uh, man maintain all of the POS and inventory and all the orders would go through there. Um, and then they wanted to have an application in store where a customer could come in, grab their phone, open the camera, don't download an app, but just visit a URL, scan a product, check out, and pay for it, and go. Don't have to wait in line, don't have to queue, don't have to do any of that. Um, that leads to greater sales for, for stance in this case. Um, but how is this actually possible? How is this possible when they're using a traditional system that they're already um, using and they weren't looking to move away from? How can they get here and uh, while maintain this in store and they didn't want to change anything in store? Well, they were able to do that because they were able to make use of some modern day APIs. And we at Molten, we said, we've got a bunch of different microservices like products. Uh, we've got other things like promotions, carts, and orders. If someone is coming into store and they're grabbing the phone, scanning that barcode, that will then talk to the Molten API to place an item into the cart, and that talks to the cart API. Uh, and then when they pay for that on their phone using Apple Pay, it's able to use a service like Stripe to get a token and authorize and capture that payment and send that straight back to the Molten API, who can then, using webhooks, relay that information to uh, 
another service that syncs with KWI. In the same way, if somebody installs to purchase something, we can in, uh, update the inventory on the app. So if someone looks to buy something and it just doesn't exist, uh, that would update the application as well in real time. So that data is just two, two, uh, two way data bound um, at all times and it's quite, it's quite powerful what you can do when you start to break it out. You don't have to use, um, you don't have to make workarounds for the legacy uh, APIs and if you don't have that opportunity to greenfield, you can make use of existing POS systems and APIs um, by using a service uh, and an API like Molten. And we call this BOIF, bring your own front end. So if you're migrating away from uh, uh, platforms like Magento, um, you know you, you kind of can use that API and bring your own front end and do what you want. So the stack, um, let's break it down, the, the Jam Commerce stack, um, and see what we can, how we can do Jam Commerce. Jam Commerce, it's not really any different to uh, a normal website. It's just a website that has some basic functionality to add to cart and check out and, and pay for something. It, that's pretty much all in a commerce store is um, at, at the roots. So on the back end, we're going to need, um, you know, we've, we've gone from the early days um, of static pages um, to dynamic, and then now we're kind of on the, the path back to uh, static web, web websites. But let's look into what the, uh, the back, end, back end can offer. So some of the back end choices is you would go with a headless API, or you would look for a, a hosted platform or a self-hosted platform. <clears throat> Uh, Magento, you could use a cloud uh, version or you could just download that and run that on your own system. Uh, then you'd have to maintain all the updates and patches and nobody really wants to do that anymore. Um, we want to do this thing at the top. Uh, we want to work with APIs. We want to pay. And we want to check out new services um, that, that work with APIs. Uh, the back end stack, some of the options, uh, commerce tools. Commerce tools is really good and I was talking um, to Garth before uh, and he, um, uh, I was talking to him about uh, my opinion on, on commerce tools and commerce tools. It's great, gets expensive really fast. Um, and it, you know, they've got a lot of functionality. Big commerce is the same. They've got a wide variety of start kits and templates and a robust plugin library. Um, but it's got some kind of bloated APIs that make it pretty uh, hard for people who are new to the stack to get up and running with. Shopify, Shopify is great. It's great for my mom who wants to set up a website and get selling and sell her cakes to her friends and family. Um, they make that really easy. Um, they've got a limited amount of APIs, so if you wanted to advance and extend, you can move to things like Shopify Plus uh, and make more, put more traffic through the service, but still you're kind of limited to, limited to some of their APIs. And they are advancing and improving in that area, um, but they're not, they're not catered around that specifically. They're all about making the selling uh, experience and building a small website uh, easy and simple as possible. And that's where Molten comes in. Molten comes in because we're able to offer something uh, that's affordable. It's very easy for developers to get up and run them with. Um, and they've got a vast amount of APIs that are not hard to use. They're just able to get up and running. And we're not the only ones in this space. There are others, um, but we make it, uh, we try, and I personally try to make it super easy to make that developer experience as easy uh, for, for people to get up and started with. So I know a lot of you here said uh, you're not familiar with this stack or you've maybe not built a store before, but um, if you want to learn programming or you want to learn how to build a store and you want to learn some of the jam stack we've got at Molten, we've got a, a wide variety of starter kits in Next.js, in Vue.js, in Angular, um, Gatsby. Come and try those out. Come and try and see how the stack works um, and it may help some, uh, some of you who are new to the stack um, get on board and see how kind of works in a bigger picture. So the front end, we've either got a static or we've got a dynamic, or we've got both. And there's both, uh, this, last, this last part, um, we're able to deliver static and dynamic web pages and commerce stores with things like Gatsby. So the front end stack, Gatsby, it's great. I can create some uh, web pages, I can create some product pages, and I'm able to deliver that to the client and then that dynamic part can take over. When the person visits the web page, they're getting that static product information. They're getting the product images that somebody uploaded a week ago, an hour ago, a month ago. They're getting that image just statically to them straight away from a CDN, closest to them from the nearest edge. You get that information, and then when somebody wants to add to the cart, that stuff's all dynamic, and it just happens after the page is loaded. So it, it makes it total sense to use something like Gatsby. Um, takes care of all the static, but I can still do some of that of that dynamic stuff as well. Uh, Next.js, Next.js is a 
uh, another option. Hands up anyone that's heard Next.js before? Cool. Um, quite a few of you, Next.js. Uh, you kind of started all this, I think, um, this, this kind of having the, both choices. They made it really easy to build server rendered React applications. Then Gatsby came along um, and made that process even, even simpler. But Next.js, um, if you are looking at this and you are new to it, I would say Next.js is great um, for building apps. And Gatsby is great if you're building websites. Uh, and you can kind of use both, um, but that's kind of the way in which I would categorize both of those. You've then got Nuxt as well. And Nuxt is uh, just Vue, but it uses, um, th again, you've got the convention uh, over configuration approach that Next have uh, and Gatsby to deliver in server rendered Rea uh, React applications. In this case, it's Vue. Um, that's kind of some of the solutions I said. We've also got Hugo, Jekyll, Middleman's another one as well. And the list goes on. As you know, JavaScript ecosystem is forever expanding. Um, we've kind of settled on some of the, the big players that we've, we've gone over. So I would advise, have a look at all of these if you're new to the stack. I, I started off with Jekyll, worked on Jekyll for numerous years. A lot of blogs on GitHub pages were powered by Jekyll. Um, and it's a very quick way just to get some HTML onto a server that you don't have to pay for um, and version controlled. It's super simple. Middleman kind of does the same thing as well. Uh, but yeah. Oh, delivery. Um, so what, what does the overall delivery look like for that static site? We automatically generate uh, a static site. We deploy it to CDN and we render that static HTML. So it's a bit different. Um, well, it's a bit similar, but it's kind of automatically handled. All of this is handled for us now. Uh, we don't have to manually upload anything. It's just deployed to a CDN with those immutable URLs with a service like Netlify. It's deployed to their CDN, and then that is just statically rendered. When you view the page, it's not having to make a call to the database. It just renders that infor uh, information. It's super fast. Um, and things like Gatsby and Next is super performant because I in all of that uh, information is just to the page straight away. Um, and Next has some cool things like prefetch where... If you're on a page uh, and it loads, Next is good because it'll do some really uh, fancy code splitting and it'll load the content on the page. And then as you go to maybe hover over a button, you can set it to then begin to prefetch that data for the next page. So it'll begin to download the JavaScript, CSS, and HTML required for the button you're about to click on. And then when you click on it, it's super fast. So you don't have to statically generate every page ahead of time if you didn't want to. There are choices there. Um, so this is a something that we see um, people at Malton using um, when they use a Jamstack. Uh, they'll either merge a pull request on GitHub with a new, uh, new header on the website or a new product layout, um, or they'll update the catalog. There could be some new stock that's added, um, or a new image, or a new description, or the products on sale. That will then fire a webhook um, to a service in the middle. Uh, we might see people doing this uh, with Netlify. So GitHub would talk to Netlify, Malton would talk to Netlify, uh, and that just sends an event to Netlify and then they would create that immutable URL. Um, and then once all that's given the green light and you merge that, that would then deploy to a CDN. And the content delivery network would then just serve up some static HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So I think all this sounds good. It sounds really fancy. Um, kind of sounds, uh, it, it does feel as though you kind of limit yourself and you lock yourself into just doing what, the, what you can do on the front end. I can only work with APIs that I'm given. However, what you can do is you can go further with lambdas. There isn't going to be one platform that takes care of all the logic that you need it to take care of. In the, in the case of Stance, uh, when someone pays, that fires a, an event to uh, AWS Lambda uh, function. Then that call, one of the things that it does inside of there, it just calls Molten. Then it'll call a, a bunch of other services. It may add that customer to a mailing list, so it might fire another hook or an event to uh, MailChimp, put that person in the mailing list, and then it may go on to do some other things and then return the response uh, that the user needs. And this is really powerful in the front end because as a front end developer, uh, working with AWS Lambda, uh, Google Cloud Platform, Azure, uh, Zeit Now is another popular one who made Next. They make the experience for a front end developer super easy to do all this server side code. You no longer need to deploy those servers and uh, maintain all that, that kind of uh, DevOps logic. As, as a JavaScript developer, you can just write some JavaScript that can um, be executed um, and given a URL that can be executed when you invoke. Um, but yeah, I would say settle on one solution, find the front end that you uh, prefer working with, whether that be React or Vue or Angular, 
Um, I really like what React does, and I, I favor a lot of the React uh, front ends. Uh, and then you kind of can go from there. You can then just settle on the platform or the API, that then you can look to expand and build the custom logic that you need with the uh, Lambda functions. And that's one of the things I say to people uh, looking at Molten uh, all the time is, we, we, do a, we do a lot and we're great at commerce. We're great at commerce, but there's some things that we just don't do. And there's certain things that other platforms just don't do. Like we wanna be the experts in having the best checkout and customer uh, experience. We can do that with our robust uh, APIs. So if you wanna do some other logic that you wouldn't expect a platform to take care of, you can just do that with uh, the Lambda function. So it all sounds expensive um, and it kind of, Kind of used to be, but um, for people building traditional websites, they'd have to scale up new servers. They'd have to uh, kind of just vertically stack the servers and make them even beefier. Um, and then some people would try and include myself, begin to try and duplicate this across different networks and edges and uh, horizontally scale your servers and all this just all this DevOps stuff is just unnecessary. I'm a front-end developer. I know some back-end stuff, but all that stuff just sounds really complex and convoluted, and you don't need to do that. But it does get expensive when when you have to do that. Uh, but one of the things at Molten that we, we kind of change from, and one of the things I'm seeing a lot of now in the industry is people are moving from paying per API request because with the Jamstack, if you're building a, a static website a, a deployment, when you go to visit a product page, you're not making that round trip to the database anymore. So the company that's hosting your data, they're not getting paid for the API request anymore. Uh, so what, what does the company do then? So the way that we do it now is we just do it based on revenues. The more you earn through your store, the more services that you're know, gonna be using from us and demanding from us, we take a, 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 you know, a cut from that as well. Um, so that's kind of how a lot of the services uh, in this space are kind of moving towards, I think. Um, if we've got time, I'd like to just kind of show a quick demo of what this looks like um, using one of our demo stores. Is that okay? Right. Uh, okay, so hopefully we can all see that. So this is a Gatsby um, demo store that we have at Molten. And as you can see, I'm just clicking around here and that is just loading instantly. You see there's a little bit of flash there when I load it to that page, and that, that's because that page isn't statically uh, rendered. This information comes dynamically from the API. So as I remove items, fingers crossed demo gods, uh, it removes that item from the page. And there's no way I can statically uh, render that. And I can remove other ones. I can then go to checkout. I can fill out my information and send all of this um, to Molten and it'll check out. As I go to a product page, and we'll go to this lamp here, we've got a product here with some information, and all of this, if I refresh, it just comes in. Uh, shouldn't have refreshed on Wi demo, guess Wi-Fi. There we go. It was super fast, it loaded the information in, and that image also lazy loaded as well. Um, and, and this is all taken care of with Gatsby. I can add this to the cart, so if I just add maybe three, I'm adding that to the cart, and you'll see that this updated in the corner. We've got five, uh, five items in the cart now. So this is a static site of all of the product pages, again, working with those dynamic APIs. But the one thing that I noticed on the product page is this product, it's called Blue Desk, not Blue Desky. So if I go into the admin and I go to manage a product, uh, logs me out. Catalog, edit blue desky, and I just correct the typo. Um, also, this product's on sale as well. I'm going to uh, I'm going to check this. Uh, th this stuff here, um, this is these fields here are custom fields that aren't built into Molten. We have an API called Flows, which allows you to extend core resources. So if you do want to store that custom data, you no longer have to roll your own database alongside those custom lambdas. You're able to use a service like this who offers that uh, schema extension to store that custom data. So if you wanted to relate products uh, and have product reviews, while we don't have an endpoint for product reviews, you can create your own data model within an API like Molten 
and store that alongside your product. So all of that is powerful and it works with uh, all of those lambdas as well. Then if I go to save this product and I head over to Netlify, I'll just refresh, you see there's a new event that's just came in at 741, it's now building my website. And this is, I haven't done anything, I have Molten configured to send a webhook. Uh, and if I load the dashboard, go back to that tab. If I go to integrations, you'll see I've got this event here and it looks a bit weird because it's zoomed in so much. But uh, I'm just observing a few events here. So pretty much all the catalog events that I want to be statically rendered. Um, every time one of these is created, updated or deleted, I will then fire a webhook to Molten. Uh, to Netlify, and that will uh, then be able to build that dynamic, uh, dynamic web page. And then on here, it will update that typo. So it's still, the, still building, but in a few minutes, that will, that will update. That's pretty much what I've got for, for you guys tonight. Is there any questions? Yeah, we got, uh, we have a variety of different endpoints, not just for adding products and creating products and, and checkout. If someone comes to a checkout and they want to add a coupon code, a discount, we have a promotions API that they can use to do that. So we take care of all that business logic and we leave the implementation up to you. So that, that, that cart and checkout experience can accept those codes and then uh, the API can handle that business logic. Um, and you know, we've got a bunch of different APIs like taxes as well. That, would, that, that, that works as well. Yeah. Yeah. So all of the static data that we have here, where when that webhook ran through Netlify, this is hosted on Netlify. The cache was invalidated immediately when uh, this was deployed. So when I merged, when I updated it, I told it to rebuild, and that's just rebuild a master on GitHub. So it rebuilds the master website, gets the master content from Molten, and rebuilds it. And that immutable URL we didn't see here, but if we did, imagine it was demo dot one two three three four dotmolten.com, that would be the immutable URL that would then go and validate the cache and then make the root URL the master for that. There, there is tools like Gatsby where you can run uh, different branches. So you can, and Netlify have A-B testing built in. So you can say, run these two different branches uh, and you can run two different versions of your uh, API content alongside that as well. So you could, you could change product names, you could change product prices, and then you could run two versions of your website um, and the kind of the delivery of that would be handled by something like Netlify or, uh, and, you know, another service. Yeah, so uh, you're able to use our platform um, up to a certain amount for free. So if you're processing a certain amount of orders, uh, as long as it falls under that threshold, it's free. If you wanted to use some of the advanced features like the, the custom schema extension, there is a fixed fee. And again, that scales based on uh, your order uh, revenue as well. Yeah, that's all part of the free tier as well. So you're able to um, add stock, decrement stock, all that's handled within, within the API and that, that's included. This is Gatsby, Gatsby, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So um, how do I, when I click this button, how, how does it update here? Yeah, so this is using Gatsby, which is using uh, built on React. So I'm able to do all of the front end code. So I literally have an event handler listening on this button. So it's listening for this button to be clicked. Once that button's clicked, it will then run a function. And that function takes some uh, parameters 
which may be the product ID and the cart ID, and then it would then fire a request off to Molten. It gets that response, and then with that response, I can say, go to the top right of this page and just update, update this part, um, and all of that's taken care of. This is using some, uh, some of the newer things of React and the context API, um, and it, it's really nice now. This whole page is bound to context, and the context is, the, 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 it has some context of cart, so when I get the response from the API, I can say just update the context. I don't have to, I don't have to worry about it updating the specific component. React will take care of that as it rehydrates the DOM. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the benefits of using uh, headless APIs in general. You can use an array of different uh, APIs with, with, with a static uh, or, or a non-static site um, and, and connect them all. And that's one of the benefits of Molten is you can deliver content from a CMS. Uh, you can deliver e-commerce product data from an e-commerce API, and they can all trigger and build uh, the static front end as well. you would pretty much favor, look for something with webhooks that can handle that. And that offloads that complexity of not being able to deal with that. You would just be able to fire a webhook and then that, that webhook uh, would go somewhere. Um, but if you're using something like Netlify, it will give you a URL. So long as you're able to fire that webhook, if, if, you, uh, if you update Contentful, you can put in a, a, a webhook there. So when you update content in Contentful, it will then fire a webhook there. If the service doesn't uh, have webhook functionality, you could create your own uh, Lambda function that would then take in content, uh, pass it on if you wanted to, um, if the API accepted that. Then the likes of Netlify building the site, this will kind of know where the source of truth is based on the code. So this will know how to go and get that content. So if you're able to just execute a webhook uh, or a, a simple post request to Netlify, then that would handle all the process for you. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Any more, is there? Yeah, so Gatsby is just a set of rules and conventions uh, <clears throat> and scripts pretty much around the React ecosystem. It's all in JavaScript that um, as long as you follow the Gatsby way, it will then just compile to React and static HTML. So the great thing about having that dynamic and static part is you get React front loaded on the page once the page is loaded and Gatsby takes care of uh, handling the static stuff. You get the best of both worlds and Gatsby is just a framework. It tells you you should put pages here, templates there, images here, and it can handle things like lazy loading the images. Um, as, I, as I change pages here, some of those Im images are a little bit blurred. That's a Gatsby plugin. And I go to this page, it's blurring it again, it's loading it in. It's just blowing up that image, tracing the image, and then present it to the screen. That's all taken care of with uh, all the Gatsby, uh, Gatsby plugins. And they've got an, uh, an array of plugins which you can use across a uh, variety of services as well. Well, yeah, yeah, it's part of the development, um, but it, put, it, it is that build tool to output, to output the static HTML. React's taken over, yeah. And then you can build all the custom logic on top of that to update things like the nav, uh, basket, quantity, et cetera. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's quite cool, it's quite powerful. Um, but this, this example here, this was only built in a few, few days. We spent a little bit more time to make it look a little bit nicer. Um, but the overall mechanics of this was built maybe in a day, half a day. Um, it's really easy once you've got that business logic taken care of to have the freedom to build and deliver what you want on the front end. So that's it. Thanks very much.